we have photographer and filmmaker James Morgan. James is based in London, but works primarily across Asia, Africa, and South America, shooting in-depth features and advocacy campaigns for a variety of clients. James uses a multimedia approach, and his features began with his work on Indonesia's Last Sea Nomads. The, image won the images won numerous awards and continue to be published and exhibited around the world. Recent work has included an, invest an investigation into the illegal wildlife trade, um, a behind-the-scenes look at an election race in Papua New Guinea, and a group of indigenous female wrestlers in Bolivia. So hopefully we'll get to see some of these now. Ladies and gentlemen, James Morgan. This is terrifying. Um, so th this first set of... Can you hear me all right? Is that, yeah. um, so this first set of images is um, a, a project that I've been doing looking at the sea and particularly our relationship to it as human beings. Um, so these guys are sea nomads. Um, basically, they live at sea year-round, um, just living solely off what they can dive and catch um, under, the, under the sea. Um, and what's unique about them is that they're kind of the end of a long tradition of sea nomadism, sea nomadism in Central Asia, in Southeast Asia, sorry. Um, they're being forced to move ashore for lots of different reasons. Um, so I was kind of excited about this project because these are kind of the last five or six people even, like really down to the last individuals who still live at sea. This is Jatmin, um, and he's just speared an, an octopus in this photograph. Um, and so basically what's happening is they're being moved ashore because they don't have ID cards and they don't have passports, and they're moving between different country boundaries like essentially illegally. So the government are trying to move them ashore. Uh, and also we're running out of fish in this area, so it's quite hard for them to actually catch enough fish to eat. Um, so this guy is called Moen Lanke. Um, and you can see how he's made his goggles. And if you can see what's holding them together, it's just a bit of fishing wire. So all this is stuff that he's just found um, lying around, basically. Anything he can scrounge, he uses for his boat. Uh, for his goggles, um, they make their own flippers, um, all sorts of very kind of, um, what's the word? Um, I don't know what the word is. Yeah, they improvise very well. Whatever they find, they find it useful. Um, so this is, this is kind of a sad picture. This is um, a lady called Annie. This is Annie in her boat. And her, um, her husband died compressor diving which is basically where you dive, and then air is pumped down to you through a tube, which means that they can dive, for deep, they can dive deeper and for longer. Um, so her husband died, and Annie is actually paralyzed uh, from the waist down um, from diving on compressor. So this is their son who has to support them, has to catch all the, all the food for them. Um, and Annie just sings. She just sits in her boat kind of year round. Uh, she's probably like 50 now. Um, she just kind of sits there watching the sea. Um, this is a happier photograph. This is Enal, or Shark Boy, as he's come to be known. Um, this has been really nice because I've had some really nice feedback from this photograph, really nice emails, and people kind of really getting into this picture. Um, so much so that last week I got an email with this. <laughs> yes. um, and it was like, Really, yeah. You know those emails you get where you think it's spam because English is so bad. And you're like, what are you, what are you talking about? Yeah, I got that, and I was like, yeah. So I don't know if I was disgusted or like honoured or what. It's good that people are seeing the pictures at least. <laughs> so this is uh, Taurus Yaje. This is so what I was saying where the government are moving these sea nomads ashore. This is an example of where it's happened. They they promised them electricity, water, um, schools, hospitals. You know the, the usual kind of development promises, um, but those haven't materialised, and so the sea nomads have moved back out to sea essentially and built their own village. So this village is about a kilometre off the coast, all on stilts, um, and kids kids these kids now go to school on the mainland, but not until they're about eleven. So they're still kind of at sea, but not in not in boats like those first guys. Um, 
So this is a kid learning to free dive. He's probably about five or six. Um, and what they do is they jump off the jetty, swim down, try and touch the floor, and then and then come back up to the surface. Um, and for this, I've been really fortunate with this project because I had a lot of funding. It's been shot in stages, um, and I've kind of come back with the photographs, and raised more money, and gone back. And we actually ended up getting like a sort of six-figure amount of money to keep working on it for the next few years, which is amazing. Um, so I've had time to learn to free dive. Uh, to speak the language they speak, like all these things, and, and kind of get really into into the project. Um, so for this photograph, we were free diving, um, and the water there is quite murky in this place. So when you dive quite deep, you're coming up and you can't see the top, and you just see all these like jellyfish. It's really kind of quite unnerving. Um, so now I've tried to expand the project to other areas. This is the Caribbean. Um, this is a guy swimming with a stingray. Uh, this is a guy in the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific um, and he's jumped on the back of this turtle ostensibly to tag it um, but as you can see it's already got tag on its flipper so he's pretty much just just riding on it um, yeah I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a go as well <laughs> um, perks of the job um, this is West Papua this is supposed to be the most a marine biodiverse place in the planet um, and to get to this place it's really remote um, we teamed up with this Dutch explorer really eccentric guy um, and he flew us along this reef um, and like looking down you can see sharks and dugongs and all sorts of things it's just a really beautiful part of the world um, so this is the, the last image from this series that I wanted to show and this is in Bali um, and what's happened is this girl has gone into a trance during a, a, a ceremony. Like a, a, in Bali, they're Hindu, but it's a strange sort of Hinduism. It's not the same as India. Um, so this picture kind of says quite a lot about what I want these images to show, which is a kind of a, a different understanding of the ocean from what we normally get, um, where it kind of becomes not just about food and stuff, but it's more about kind of some of the... I don't know, some of the other things, some of the other ways that the ocean sustains us, like spiritually, I guess. Um, but quite hard to explain that sort of stuff. So. Um, this is just some examples of, of where it's been run. This is uh, the Sunday Times. They've, they've been quite supportive of the project. This is The Guardian. They've got involved. This is New Scientist and South China Morning Post. And this is WWF, who have been the main sponsor of it. Um, a lot of this has been used for their advertising, essentially. Um, yeah, so that's that. if anyone's got questions, by the way, please just jump in and I'll try and spot them. Um, yeah, shoot. Um, I think your work is absolutely stunning. I looked at it before I came here. Oh, thank you. Animals. It's very kind. Sorry. It's um, very kind. Huge um, lover of nature and the way you portrayed it is stunning. I used the words six figure sum to fund what you're doing. I don't overly agree with five or six. Sorry, I don't want to go all political here, but five or six year olds diving and depression and all the things that happened. And horrific, but at the same time, a living in a beautiful space and what they do. Um, can we ask what the, what the money's for? The funding yeah, so for your photography. It's not just my photography. Basically, what, what I do quite often is I'll team up with um, particularly NGOs and I'll produce images that help them raise funds. Um, that can then be used for all sorts of things. So this money that we've raised is to get other stories from the area. So basically to, to fund like local journalists, um, hundreds of local journalists essentially, to produce stories and then to try and place those stories in the media in the West. So it's essentially it's a conservation thing, but it's kind of empowering local people to tell their stories through, you know, through mediums that they don't normally get to... Exp to express yeah, themselves through. Do whole... Exactly, yeah. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Uh, right, so the next thing I want to show you is from Bolivia. Um, and this is uh, a story that was for the Guardian Weekend magazine initially. Um, yeah? What did you shoot on? I, I shoot on uh, a variety of cameras, like mostly DSLRs. They mostly DSLRs. The video. Video. This is a Canon 1DC. So it's a, a DSLR, Canon DSLR. Um, 
Is that gentleman? Um, yeah, so this is a group of female wrestlers in Bolivia who are fighting, fighting back against discrimination on the grounds of their gender and their ethnicity. Um, so I'm going to show a video because I don't really like talking that much. So. <laughs> de sangre de luchador. Ya estoy 15 años encima del cuadrilátero, luchando. Ha empezado como un juego, como una curiosidad. La misma duda que tenían, la inseguridad de los varones de que una mujer, y más aún llevando esta vestimenta aymara, iba a poder entrar en este deporte tan riesgoso. Queremos dar ese aliento a las mujeres para que ninguna mujer boliviana, ni extranjera, ninguna mujer del mundo sea discriminada. Y con este deporte de la lucha libre, estamos demostrando que la mujer es fuerte, emprendedora, que no se deje derrotar. Basta que te discriminen, basta que te sigan humillando, tú puedes, como Yolanda la Amorosa ha podido. So this, um, this last set of images, this is um, the island of New Guinea. So this is just above Australia. Um, to the right, you've got South Pacific, and the left is Indonesia. Um, I just put a map up because not many people know where it is. It's actually the second, second biggest island in the world after Greenland. Um, the left-hand side is West Papua, which is um, Officially Indonesia, but it's a contested territory. They've been fighting for independence sort of since the 60s. Um, and I've worked there a couple of times in, under fake visas, and it's, it's always like quite a terrifying experience. You end up kind of smuggling memory cards out in your socks and stuff like that. Um, it's definitely a place I want to keep working, but it's, it's, it's quite intense and, yeah, not, not the most pleasant place for, for a few reasons. Um, but today I want to show some photos from the right-hand side, which is Papua New Guinea. Um, I was in Papua New Guinea uh, working for USAID, which is kind of the development arm of the US government, um, and they were, they were putting some more money into this work on the sea. Um, but after that I met this man, uh, Lester, who is a criminal basically from Moresby, the capital of Papua New Guinea. Port Moresby is kind of quite a notorious city in, in Southeast Asia for just violent crime. Um, and Lester had a story which he told me about um, how he followed a Malaysian man into a bank and the guy came out with cash in a briefcase strapped to his arm and this guy just cut his arm off. He took the, took the briefcase and the arm, just, I guess just discarded the arm somewhere. Um, and yeah, and he had a, a lot of stories like this, but with this particular story, he, he went through a kind of a reforming phase later in his life. He went through three or four and then dropped back into crime. Um, but in one of these phases, he found this businessman um, and took him out to dinner like just to apologize I think essentially was, was the thinking um, but yeah I, apparently it went terribly and the guy tried to kill him in the restaurant <laughs> <laughs> like obviously um, but it kind of got me thinking about about violence as um, as kind of a shaping force in a community because everywhere I went in in Papua New Guinea I was met with the same stories and the same kind of the same kind of constant fear of violence that people live in like more so than anywhere else that I've travelled. Um, so I spent a bit of time with the police, just seeing how they were kind of underfunded, um, outgunned, um, corrupt, etc. Uh, so this is a group of drug dealers from the Highlands. Um, <laughs> yeah, quite a bunch. Um, 
And what they do, because Papua New Guinea, because there is so much marijuana, it grows um, kind of like a weed almost there. Yeah, no pun intended. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it's very hard to sell it. Um, so what they do is they give it to the logging companies, and the logging companies export it, along with their legitimate cargo, to West Papua, where it's swapped for guns. There's a lot of guns left over just because the Civil War's been going on for so long. And the guns come back to... Um, Papua New Guinea and are sold and that's kind of the trade, that's, that's how a lot of the criminal money comes into Papua New Guinea um, and this was kind of a pivotal story for me because because um, I was shooting something on violence and crime but I was also like incredibly bored of these subjects I was just like, I see so much of this in the newspapers every day um, not, um, not in Papua New Guinea necessarily but we see you know crime and violence the whole time um, and so I kind of decided that I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to photograph kind of instances of violence and more just, you know, the, the sort of facts of violence. I wanted to try and photograph it in a different way, I suppose, um, by showing kind of, yeah, how it's a shaping force, I guess, and how it kind of affects the way people live and the way people make decisions in a community. Um, so. Instead of going to Moresby and spending more time with the criminals, I went like deeper into the highlands to look at kind of the roots of it and the, the traditions. Um, so what happens in, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea is you have a few towns, like three or four kind of main towns, um, and all these communities come out of the jungle, um, all with different ideas, all with different beliefs, different kind of community practices, essentially. And they're all mixed together in these towns. So you get some like really fascinating exchanges, but also a lot of kind of intertribal conflict. Um, and there's a lot of just, there's a lot of discussion, I suppose, more so than anywhere else that I've been, is people just genuinely don't know what's going on. Or like, not that anyone knows what's going on anyway, but they, they know that they don't know because they're faced with so many ideas the whole time. And on top of that, you, you have a lot of missionaries there, uh, mostly Seventh-day Adventists. And because of the crime, they live in these communities, like outside of town, um, kind of gated communities. And if you walk into them, they look like you're walking into Mississippi, you know, they're really surreal kind of places. So this is in one of those. Um, and this is a girl, I don't know her whole story, but essentially she's kind of been taken under the wing of, of some missionary. Um, so this woman is Mama Kinano, um, and she's a witch doctor. Um, she heals broken bones, mostly from domestic violence, but also from shootings and, and just general crime. Um, so these last images, this is from a political rally. Um, this girl is a girl called Vegu, um, who was, who's the little sister of someone that was kind of um, a, sort of like a fixer um, that I was using, but in a much more kind of flexible, friendly kind of way. Um, so this, the, these images are all from a political rally where we went to a really remote village. It took like days to get there um, with the local MP who was campaigning for re-election. Um, he had actually built a road to the village, but after about a day's driving, we realised that he hadn't finished it yet, <laughs> and so it took forever to get there. Um, and this is this is a mumu, which is like an earth oven. They cook lots of food um, all at the same time underground. Um, and when I came back, I had amoebic dysentery and all sorts of horrible things. I think this was probably the culprit <laughs> of it. Um, so when we eventually got there, this is what we found, <laughs> which was a bit of a trip. Um, basically what's happened, I mean, there are kind of two stories here. Like One is that these kids have shaved off their head, uh, shaved their hair off, sorry, and stuck it onto their faces. <laughs> like, one story is that it's because they want to look like dwarves, which are considered lucky throughout Papua New Guinea. Um, but the other theory is that they look just like the MP that we were travelling with, like <laughs> sp spitting image. Um, and I never found out what the truth was, but they freaked me out. <laughs> it's, there's something, uh, something deeply, deeply haunting about it. Um, so this is just some tear sheets again. The, the Royal Photographic Society, they're based in Bath, I think it is, in the UK. Um, but they're really good for, for getting funding for a lot of these slightly more unusual projects. They're quite often happy to put money towards this kind of stuff where, where other people won't. It's quite difficult to get funding for this kind of stuff sometimes. 
um, for Sunday time again. Yeah. Uh, so I just have one more video, and then I'm done. Uh, this, so this last film, this is really recent. Um, this was just, I mean, this isn't really even finished yet. It's a trailer for, I do, if I can make it work. Is it on the screen? Um, yeah, so this is quite recent. This is um, Sumba, which is a little island in Indonesia, um, which no one's really heard of um, because it's kind of, it hangs off the bottom of Indonesia and it's, it's another one that's a bit tricky to get to. And um, yeah, it's kind of a strange place. Um, but this film is about the Pasola Festival, which happens every year, where rival clans ride on horseback and throw spears at each other. Um, so that blood is spilt. So the blood being spilled ensures a good harvest. It's kind of like a blood libation, that sort of, that sort of thinking. Um, this video does have a, like a couple of seconds of animals getting hacked up horribly. So if you don't like that kind of stuff, which I don't, um, I just thought I'd warn you so you can show your eyes. So that's me pretty much done, really. Um, basically, yeah, like the stuff that I, that I really enjoy is um, stories about kind of, pe I guess, people living closer to nature than, than perhaps we do in London, um, but without kind of glossing it too much. So you kind of see the beauty of it and the horror of it. And it kind of, those kind of stories are quite a good way of talking about kind of bigger human things, um, but they kind of exaggerate the issues that we all have. Um, so that's kind of the idea, that's sort of the overarching idea of it all. The end. Enjoy.